Well, I've been thinking and pondering, and I've come to a realization. I need some me time. I, I need to focus more on me. I need time just to kind of get my attention on me and take care of me and comfort me and provide for me. It's just, it's just, it's just what I've been thinking. It's just what's been on my mind. And, and, and then also, you know, I think people need to know that my truth is my truth. You might have your truth, but I have my truth. Everyone can have their own truth. I mean, that's, that's what the world's telling us. It's about me time. It's about my truth. It's so much about my truth that there really, is, really isn't any truth anymore except for what's personally truth for me. And so maybe I need to discover that. I, I've been thinking that, that I need to get my opinion out there more. You need to know my opinion. It is important to me that you know my opinion. On what? Everything. So I'm going to write it. I'm going to tweet it. I'm going to post it. I'm going to preach it. I'm going to tell you because you knowing my opinion really matters to me. And that's my opinion. All right? That's the world we live in. And if we're not careful, even if, you're, even if you've come to the cross and received Jesus Christ and you love Jesus, if we're not careful, we'll get sucked into this vortex of this cultural stream that says it's about me time, my time, my opinion, my truth. And all of a sudden what happens is we become the son of our own personal little universe and we believe that everybody and everything else all kind of, kind of revolves, kind of orbits around who? Me. We got to be very, very careful. Because not only does that happen, but it's not even frowned on anymore. I mean, we're, we're about selfies. Cameras used to point away from us. Now they have a camera on both sides. Because we've got to make sure we're in the picture. And, 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 and we've we, we got to get fans and followers and more friends. And that, that's the world we live in. When Sherry and I started in publishing, and probably about 15, 20 years ago, we were told, and I was told specifically by two different publishers, you need to grow your fan base. I thought, what? I last on social media for half a day. I tried it for half a day. And I said, that's enough for me. And my publisher said, but you need to have, but I said, I don't need a fan base. I, I, if anyone's going to be a fan of somebody, it should be a fan of Jesus, not of me. But that's the world we live in. We've got to be very, very careful because into a world where we talk about me time and my opinion and my truth and a world where that's almost become a normative sort of a thing enters Jesus Christ. Jesus walks into that world. And here's the thing about Jesus. He is the son that all things should orbit around. Jesus is the son of the living God. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. If there's anyone that everything should revolve around, it's Jesus Christ. And he came among us to serve. He came among us to show us what it looks like to live a life that honors him, that gives him glory. Jesus, at the Last Supper, when he was sitting with his followers, Jesus saw the basin by the door as he came in. He saw the pitcher. He saw the towel. And during the meal, he got up from the table, and he went over, and he got those common instruments Things that were there in many homes. You could walk into many homes in the ancient world because people walked on dirty, dusty streets. And there would be a bowl, there would be a pitcher, there'd be water, there'd be a towel. Sometimes there'd be a servant there. And that servant's role would be to wash your feet. It was just, it was just something that was done because of the cultural day, because feet were dirty. And sometimes if there was no servant there to wash feet, sometimes one of the guests, when they arrived, would you say, oh, there's no servant here. Well, let me go ahead. And, and they would offer to wash feet. It'd be like going to someone's home and it's kind of a cold night, everyone's wearing a coat, and you get there and everybody's wearing coats and they're coming in, where do you hang your coat? You don't even, you're not even the host, you don't even live there. Oh, let me get that for you. You start collecting coats, you just have a humble heart, you, you start taking coats, putting them in a, you know, find a place to put them down, and you, you're helping out. Well, people would, would have done that in the ancient world, but this particular gathering at the Last Supper, all the disciples are on the table and everyone's feet are still dirty. Not, not one of them, after three years walking with Jesus, after three years walking with the one who was teaching them about humility, not one of them thought, maybe I'll offer to do this. So Jesus gets up and goes over and, and kind of changes clothes and gets in the, in the outfit that a servant would have in the ancient world. And you can almost see the disciples like, oh, I missed it. 
I should have I offered to do that. I mean, I should have offered to do that for Jesus at least. Maybe the other disciples. And then Jesus goes around where they're reclining at the table, and one by one, the hands of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, the King of kings, the maker of heaven and earth, took water, and one by one, the hands of God washed the feet of people. One by one, he washed their feet. Thomas's feet, who would doubt. Judas's feet, who would betray. Peter's feet. Remember Peter's response. We talked about this last week. Peter's response was to say, Lord, Lord, no, 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 you, don't, you shouldn't wash my feet. And Jesus says, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, you have no part of me. So what's Peter's response? Well, then wash all of me. Jesus says, Peter, settle down. Just your feet. Only your feet are dirty. And he washes his feet. And then he dries each of their feet with a towel. And he goes back to the table. And last week we kind of stopped there, a little cliffhanger in the middle of John, this passage in John 13. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 13. If you have your Bible on your phone or your iPad, go to John 13 because we're going to walk through this biblical text and we're going to finish this story. Now we're back at the table. So that's where we pick it up at John chapter 13, beginning in verse 12. We're back at the table. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? Do you really understand, Jesus asked, what I just did, what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord, your Messiah, and your teacher have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Lord Jesus, speak to us today. Even as you spoke to your followers 2,000 years ago at that table where you broke the bread, where you poured out the cup, where you shared communion, at the Last Supper, where you washed feet, May we learn, Jesus, as your followers today, what you taught your followers then. Speak to our hearts, we pray, and transform our lives. We ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, look at me at verse 12 of John 13. Jesus begins by really asking this question. Do you understand? Do you really understand what just happened? Here's how it plays out in the passage. Verse 12. When he, Jesus, had finished washing their feet... He put his clothes back on. He returned to his place. He said, do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. Do you understand? Now, he's not just saying, do you understand? He's saying, do you understand? Do you really get what just happened? There's lots of times in life where we understand, but we don't understand. Do you understand? Follow me, <laughs> right? So, so, so somebody says, I'm going to enlist and go in the military. And someone says, do you understand what you're doing? They say, yeah, it'll be like camping out. It's going to be so much fun. We're just going to go and do fun stuff. And, and, uh, and, and somebody who's in the military says, no, do you understand? It may be the right decision for you, but do you understand what you're doing right now? Do you understand what you're committing to? Because sometimes we can say we understand and not understand. And what Jesus wants to know is, do you understand what I just did? Someone's thinking, a couple's thinking about having kids. So we're going we're gonna to start a family. And somebody with kids says, do you understand what you're doing? Do you understand? Oh, yeah. It's going to be great. I want to have children who from the first day they're born will just love me and lavish me with their attention. You don't understand. <laughs> you don't understand that for the first three months, six months, 12 months, you know, 18 months, 14 years, um, 18, you know, you know, it, it's, it's an investment. Do, do you understand? When someone becomes a follower of Jesus, Jesus said, do you understand what it means to follow me? Do you remember what Jesus said? If you want to be my person, if you want to be my disciple, you'll just deny yourself every day, take up your cross, be willing to die, and follow me with everything I want you to do. That's all. Do you understand? Everybody following here? So here Jesus says, it's one of these moments, do you understand what I've done for you? 
And there were, there were sort of two ways that the disciples could have responded in understanding. One, they could have said, yeah, we understand. You washed our feet, and we should have done that when we came. We didn't think about it, and we'll try harder next time. And, but, but thanks, our feet feel refreshed, and they're clean, and we got it. No, no. Do you understand that the God of the universe, who entered human history in human flesh, is now in front of you? And I chose to get on my knees, Emmanuel, God with you, and wash your feet. Do you understand what just happened? Because Jesus understood that they didn't really understand, not fully. And I think sometimes we don't understand what it means that Jesus would wash feet. And shortly after this, this is the Last Supper, Shortly after this, Jesus is hanging on a cross. And the God of the universe, whose hands just cast the stars across the sky, was now nailed to a cross. And every judgment and punishment that we deserved for our sins was heaped on Jesus, and he took them. And all of our shame that we felt was put upon him. And all the judgment we deserved was taken by Jesus Christ. Do you understand what it means to say that Jesus Christ has served you? Do you understand what I've done? If you're not amazed and staggered and overwhelmed, then we've got to say, God, help me understand the greatness of what it means to say that our God came to serve. Jesus, speaking of himself in in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Do you understand? Do you realize what Jesus did? Because they need to understand so they can then become who they need to become. And so Jesus begins here. We have to ask ourselves, do I understand? And then Jesus makes a declaration in verse 13 of John 13. He says, you know who I am. He says, I know that you know who I am. Look what he says in verse 13. He says, you call me rabbi, you call me teacher, and you call me Lord, Messiah, Savior, right? You call me teacher, and you call me Messiah, Lord. And rightly so, for that is what I am. Jesus says, That's, you declared who I am, and I want you to know you're right. Bingo, ding, 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 you got it. Do you understand that the one who just washed your feet is the Lord of all, is the Lord of glory? Are you putting all these pieces together? And, and, and it's important that we understand who our Jesus is, this, this foot-washing God, this divine one who came among us, who was the great rabbi, who was the Lord of all, who was the Messiah. And so here's the question. Do I know who Jesus is, really? Do I really know who this Jesus is? Do I hold to that and do I embrace that? Because when I do, I'm going to live like him. I'm going to follow him. So do you understand who he is Do you know who he said he was? In the Christian church over the centuries, Christians have tried to sort of put together these simple statements of what we believe. Back in the third century, fifth century, sixth century, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, Christians came together. They tried to frame and put into words, what is it that we Christians believe? And there's three enduring, what are called ecumenical creeds. They're statements of belief, they're statements of faith that could be used by any Christian church anywhere. They're the core of who Jesus, who our Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who our God is, what he did. And in one of those creeds called the Nicene Creed, as it begins the part of talking about Jesus, there's these words. And some of you, maybe if you grew up in a church context, you might even have these come back to your mind, remembering this from your childhood. But they're so powerful. This is a kind of an effort to put into words, who is this Jesus that we gather to worship? Who is this Jesus who chose to wash our feet and die on a cross for us? So in this creed, the Nicene Creed, we read these words. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages. And listen to this. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. This divine God came among us and he washed feet and died on a cross. And then, in verses 13 and 14, we find what I call the great if-then. What Jesus is now is going to say is, okay, if this is the case, then you ought to live this way. If this is the case, you should think this way. If this is true, then this should move you to action. So now Jesus is going to get into this, this, this epic if-then. 
Look at verse 14 of John 13. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, we've just agreed that I am, I am the Messiah, I'm the Lord, and I'm the rabbi, the teacher. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. This is the foundation of discipleship. What is a disciple? A disciple is a follower. A Christian disciple is, disciple is a follower of Jesus. And this is the core. He said, Jesus says, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet because I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. You should follow my example. You should live the way I lived. You know why? Because that's what Christians do. That's what we do. That's our lives. Is striving to be more and more like Jesus Christ, to walk in his footsteps, to live like him, to be the people he's called us to be. And, and so we seek to follow him. And for us as Christians, here's one of the things it means. It means that the Lord who washed our feet, the Lord who took our sin and bore our shame and died on the cross for us. If you want to look at an ultimate act of service, washing feet is small compared to dying on a cross. He died on a cross for you and for me. And he says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have lived for you and served you, now you should serve others. How? The way I served you. It's not an optional deal. It's who we are as followers of Jesus Christ. It's what we do. And that's why we're calling this series The Call to All. To, the call to every... If you say, I am a Christian, then you are a servant. We're called to humble service. If you say, I'm a follower of Jesus then you've got to share his love with others and care for them and serve them in his name. If you say, I'm a Christian, then you got to say, okay, then Lord, how have you gifted and called me to use my gifts for your glory? Do you understand that if you're a follower of Jesus, the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, for my wife, Sherry, she was five years old. For me, I was 15, almost 16 years old. We have people, I have people sitting around the courtyard right now that I can see their faces and know... Uh, January 26th. I mean, I know when people became followers of Jesus around this courtyard who are walking with them now, right? If you, if you are a follower of Jesus, then you say, then Lord Jesus, how can I serve in your name and for your glory? It's what we do. It's who we are. Christians follow Jesus. So here's the question. Am I swept into the divine if then? Has the Spirit of God swept you into this divine if then? If I'm a follower of Jesus and the Spirit of God lives in me, then whether I was 5 or 15 or 25, at that moment, the Spirit of God placed a gift inside of me, a spiritual gifting, and I'm to use it for the glory of God. I'm to serve in the name of Jesus. It might be in my home. It might be in my neighborhood. It might be in the public sphere. It might be in the church. It might be in our community. But I am called in some way, shape, or form to serve others in the name of Jesus. And I can do it according to the gifting that God has placed within me. So we get swept into this divine if-then. So here's, here's some if-thens, all right? Here's the first one. If he served me, then I will serve others. If he served me, then I will serve others. Has he served you? Has Jesus served you? Did he bear your sins? Did he take your shame? If you're a follower of Jesus, you know he has, and you praise him for that. Then you say, then I will serve others. If he loved me, then I will freely love in his name. Has Jesus extended love to you? Then love others the way Jesus has loved you, even when they're difficult to love, because Jesus loved us when we were difficult to love. If he cleansed me, if he's cleansed me, then I will tell others that cleansing is freely available. If you look and say, by the grace of God, all my sins are washed away. I have been cleansed. I'm washed clean. Praise God. Is that true? Yes or no? In, in Christ, are you cleansed of all your sin? Yes or no? Yes, so we're cleansed. Then... I probably ought to let other people know he can cleanse them too, right? Is his grace big enough for all? Yes. The Bible says that God desires that none would perish, but all would come to a knowledge of salvation. That's the heart of God. If I've been cleansed, I can let other people know he wants to cleanse you too. I can share that good news with other people as God opens the door. Here's another if then. If he called me, then I will do the ministry he has assigned me. If God has called me, I will do whatever ministry he has assigned me. Now, some of you think, well, this one doesn't apply to me because I'm not a minister. Yes, you are. All the word minister means is servant. That's all it means. 
You might say, I'm not a reverend, I'm not a pastor, I don't pastor a church. Some people do, a handful of people, but you might say, but I'm not a minister. No, if you're a Christian, you are a minister. And because God has placed a gift within you, what you need to do now is discover what that gifting is, to develop that gift and use it for the glory of Jesus. And that will change the world. And our world needs some changing. I'm convinced that our world will change when millions and millions of millions of Christians start to humbly serve in the name of Jesus more than any other movement. The movement of the church will change the world. I believe that with all my heart. And so, so today, actually, at 1 o'clock today, so kind of right after this service, if you're at home online, if you're in the courtyard, you can go online and just open up the Shoreline website and right under the live stream button, right underneath it, it says Spiritual Gifts Class. And today we're offering a class. My wife Sherry will be leading it. It's a short teaching on what does it mean to be gifted by the Spirit, given a spiritual gift. It's a test to figure out what your gifting is. And then if you want to, you can say, I'd like to meet with a leader at Shoreline who will walk me through how I can grow that gift and use it for the glory of Jesus. Not one person in all of our church, online, parking lot, courtyard, not one person who does it, who wants to meet with somebody will be told no. That's what we do as a church is we want to mobilize God's people to do what God's made us to do. So, so if you say, man, I'd love to do that, one o'clock today, register right away when the service is done, not during the service online, after the service. But, but be part of that. If you've never done a spiritual gifts test, if, you don't, if you're not engaged in serving right now, I encourage you to be part of that. And that will help you take a step forward. If he's called me, I will do the ministry he has assigned. As I was thinking about this, what came to my mind is a couple of characters in the Bible who talk about how if they, if they don't do what God's made them to do, then, then they, just, they just don't they feel like they could go on. They couldn't live. If they're not serving using their gifts. You know, when I became a follower of Jesus, when I became a Christian, I was 15 years old, almost 16. The night I prayed to receive Jesus, I heard God speak to me, not in my ears, but just in my heart. But this is what I heard God say to me. I heard God say, spend the rest of your life telling people about Jesus or you'll be miserable. It was that clear. Spend the rest of your life telling people about Jesus or you'll be miserable. Now you might think that seems like harsh for God to tell a 15-year-old, do this or you'll be miserable. But I didn't know much at 15, but I knew this much. I didn't want to be miserable, right? So I said, okay. The next morning, I was at, I was at this youth uh, houseboat water ski trip where I became a Christian here in, in the Sacramento area. And the next morning, I talked to the youth leader. And I said, what do I have to do to become a pastor? And his, his response was this. He said, dude, you've been a Christian for like seven hours. I grew up in a, I grew up in a secular home. He said, dude, you've been a Christian for like seven hours. I said, yeah, but i got to become a pastor because i got to tell people about Jesus. What do I do? He said, get a haircut. I said, really? Because I, I, I was a surf rat, right? I said, really? He goes, no, I'm just kidding. But you should get a Bible. And you should learn what it says. And that was the beginning of my journey because I'd never had a Bible before. That was, that's where it started. But can I tell you, within about a year, the youth leader of that church had me teaching in a high school group. And I, I would study this book. I was 16 years old. I'd prepare messages. I'd bring them. And I was in this, all the other people who taught the high school group were college students. And this group of guys, after I was done, they would just like rip me to shreds. They would just tell me what I did wrong. You could have said this better. And you didn't, you, why didn't you quote that? And they just would like just... I know, I don't, I'm not been in the military, but it, you know, I, I know there's times where they feel like, well, if we dismantle it, we can put you together and you'll be better off afterwards. Well, they kind of dismantled and didn't really work too hard to put me back together, but I'm okay. So I'll be all right. But, but, but I can tell you this. At 16 years old, every chance I got to open this book and teach about Jesus, I felt humbled and in awe. Every chance I got to talk with somebody about the love of God and the love of Jesus. I didn't know what the gift of evangelism was. I, ha I have it. I had it, then I have it now. Not everyone has that gift. We're all called to shine the light of Jesus. Some people are evangelists. I'm an evangelist. But I started to use those gifts. And can I tell you what? I didn't become a pastor for like almost 10 years later. It, was never my, it wasn't my job for almost a decade. I just did it because this is what God called me to do. This is who God called me to be. And if you know your gifting and you follow him, you'll experience the same thing. And you'll start to feel like this. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, 16 says this. He says, for when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast since I am compelled to preach. And Paul says this, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul says, I have to do it. It's what God's made me for. Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29 says this. But if they say, I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Jeremiah says, I can't hold in what God's put inside of me. And for some of you, that's been your experience. Right, right now, this moment, right now, there are volunteers, people who are using their gifts to love and teach children the word of God four rows down of our parking lot down there. 
Some of your kids and grandkids have people investing in their lives right now, serving, using the gifts of God to bring Jesus glory and to bless your kids and grandkids. At five o'clock this morning, some of the people that are running our cameras and serving here were here at five this morning. It was chillier than it is right now. And they were here faithfully serving, getting ready for you, using their gifts to serve Jesus Christ. Musical gifts, intercessory prayer gifts. Some of you at home that are saying, I still really haven't been out of my house very much. Man, prayer you can do from anywhere. And we have a prayer ministry here at Shoreland. You might say, man, I want to get more involved in that. I want to use my gifts of intercessory prayer, my passion to pray for the glory of Jesus. Teaching gifts, compassion gifts. Are, we, we now have, we're, we're serving between 600 and 900 people food every week now. And about 75% of those people, when we say, can we pray for you, say yes. And many of them aren't followers of Jesus. But they're hungry for food and they're hungry for something more. And they say yes. And, the, and, and that's done because vast, the vast majority of hours put in there are volunteers humbly serving in the name of Jesus Christ. I can't not do what God's made me to do. Can you say that? Is that the condition of your heart? If then, if he named me, then I will live with humble confidence. If God says who I am, I can't disagree with God. And you know what God says? He says, I am a child of God. I am a royal priest. I am a friend of God Almighty. See, what happens for many people when it comes to humble service is they'll say, well, I can't serve in the church or I can't serve in the community because you don't know my background. You don't know my history. And God says, I know who you were, but I know who you are. And you are my child. And you're made a saint in my name. And you are a royal priesthood, and you are my friend. You serve not because of who you think you were. You serve because of who I've made you. Do you know who you are? And will you follow God's leading? The Apostle Paul, one of those quotes I read who said, I can't not preach. The Apostle Paul was murdering Christians before he became a Christian. And God said, I can use you to write books of the Bible. Right? Right? And if you hear a voice telling you, God can't use you. You can't serve in any way to make a difference in the lives of others for the sake of Jesus. That's a lie from the pit of hell. That is from the enemy. That is not true. Because the Apostle Paul would say, if God can use me, he can use anyone. And I can tell you as a pastor, if God can use me, he can use anyone. Not everyone knows your story, but God does. And he has still gifted you and called you. So, so we don't, Lay out excuses, we follow. And then one more if then. If he empowers me, then I will stand strong. If I understand the filling and the power of God's presence and his Holy Spirit, then I will stand strong and do the work he's called me to do. I love in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, where it's talking about the armor of standing strong and, and, and being in the armor and being ready to stand for Jesus. And in verse 13 we read, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the, evil day, the day of evil comes, and it will, you may be able to stand your ground. And having done everything to stand, stand firm. You get the message? Stand, stand, stand. Don't let the enemy push you down. Don't let other people lie to you about who you are and push you down. And don't push yourself down and say, I could never. Who are you in Jesus? Have you, has he filled you with his spirit? Has he gifted you? And if he hasn't, if you don't know if he's gifted you, find out today, one o'clock. Seriously, I, I, that's not a commercial. We, we get nothing from putting that class on. It's not like we get a credit or anything. We want you to be unleashed to live for Jesus and to serve him. And that happens when you know your gifting and when you use it. And then Jesus goes on in verse 16 to address this question of who's greater. And he's just trying to make a point. He's saying, he's really, here's what Jesus is really saying. He's saying, who's greater, me or you? That's what Jesus is asking. Who's, just to ask, who's greater, me or you? So here's how Jesus puts it, all right? He says, very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And by the way, you're not greater than me, is the subtext, right? Why is he saying that? Because he's saying, I washed your feet. I've served you. I'm going to the cross. If I would serve this way, then why wouldn't you? This is what we do as followers of Jesus Christ. And so here's the question, do I have the right perspective? Do I see myself the way God sees me or the way other people see me? And do I see my ability to serve Jesus based on how other people would judge me or how Jesus Christ has filled me and leads me? Do we have the right perspective? And then the final verse, and I, and I, love, where it, I love that it ends here. It's so beautiful. The source of blessing. 
Man, so many Christians, I want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. I want more stuff and more trinkets and more toys. I want, bless me, Lord, bless me. I, I don't think that's the greatest blessing. Here's the greatest blessing. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. What's he talking about? What's the entire last two weeks of, of John 1 through, uh, one, uh, John 13, 1 through 70, what's it about? It's about humbly serving. He says, if now that you know these things, now that you know who you are, now that you know who I am, now that you know what I've done for you, now that you know, you know your call to serve, you will be blessed if you do them. You know what the pathway to blessing is? Humbly serving in the name of Jesus. Your spouse, your friends, your family, your kids, your neighbors, people who don't like you, humbly serving in the name of Jesus, our community, in your church, humbly serving in the name of Jesus is the source of the greatest blessing. When you, when you say, God, I'm broken, I don't have it all together, but I feel like you've called me to intercede in prayer. I feel like you've called me to show compassion in the food pantry. I feel like you've called me to, to share your love in my neighborhood. I feel like you've called me to serve in, in my home, wherever it is. And when you live that out, and you see that the God of the universe uses you to change the world and to touch other people's lives, there is no better blessing than when you realize, oh, Lord, this is what I live for. I'm going to do things in this life that are led by the hand of God that will change this world and people for eternity. It's worth it every single time. Do we understand that? Do we hold to that? Do we embrace it? Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Know it, do it, and then watch God bless. And so I want to encourage you just in two simple ways. One, if you've never discovered your spiritual gifting, this is really important. One o'clock today, make it happen. And if you can't do it at one o'clock today, send a note to the church and just say, I couldn't make it at one o'clock today, but I want to do that and we'll find another time. We'll make it work. And I would really encourage you, if you do that and you see what your gifting is, that you would, if you'd be open to do it, say, I want to meet with someone at Shoreline to have a conversation and see if I can find ways to grow that gifting and to use it for the glory of Jesus. And here's the second thing. Would you go on the Shoreline website and just look at what's going on and say, say boy, I've got a heart for children. Now, right now, we're already relaunching children's ministry, but we're going to keep every step we're able to take back into doing the ministry God's called us to do. We're, we are, like, literally waiting to... <laughs> Jump in. Following me? We're, like as a staff, we are there. We are ready. And every time we're able to take the next step, we're going to take it. We need God's people ready to step in. Because, because for some people in the season, people have said, well, okay, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of retiring from serving. A lot of people have kind of stepped back. It's like, well, I'm, I'm older now. I'm not going to serve. It's COVID time. I'm not going to serve. I'm just tired. Not going to serve. Uh, someone, someone else's turn. I've kind of retired from that. The Bible never talks about retiring from serving Jesus. Whatever the reason is, I want to say, if you're a follower of Jesus, he has gifted you. If you're a follower of Jesus, he has called you. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's time to find out, Lord, what is it you have for me? And to find that blessing and joy of serving and living for Jesus. So look on the website and see all the ministries that are happening. But particularly, we're going to have kind of a hot spot on the website from now going forward. And it's there right now. If you go on the website, you look up at the top right, the different columns, there's one that says, Get Involved. And if you click Get Involved, all the way, it pulls up a whole menu. Bottom left is one that says service opportunities. Those are the hot issues right now, like six areas right now that we need volunteers right now. And we're going to keep updating that every week, year round. So if you're like, man, I want to get involved and serve. Where's there a need? You don't even have to ask. Just go right there. But if you don't, but if you can't figure that part out, call us at the church and we'll talk with you about it. Because as a congregation, we are going to keep stepping into God's plan for us. And things have slowed down and things have stalled for a number of months. But if you're watching closely at Shoreline, at every single step, we're doing all we can to grow believers, to reach the Lord. We had more people put faith in Jesus in 2020 than did in 2019 or 2018. That's amazing. That's because we didn't close up shop. We continued being the church. And we'll keep doing all we can. I invite you to say, Lord Jesus, what's my next step in service? Jesus, that's our prayer. Will you put in our mind... A picture of you, Jesus, God among us, Emmanuel, the King of kings who came to give yourself for us on the cross. May we see you kneeling down and washing the feet of broken people. May we see you giving your life on the cross for us, for our sins. May we hear your voice again telling us what it means to follow you, to, to deny ourselves, to take up the cross every day, and to follow you 
into a, a lifetime of serving in your name. Lord, we believe that this world needs an outpouring of millions upon millions upon millions of Christians who are living a life of humble service, showing the presence of Jesus. May we be numbered among them for your glory. And as we live it out, may we see an incredible blessing of being faithful to your call. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen. I give you an invitation to a couple of things. One, if you need prayer, we have a prayer team. And they delight to pray for you. So if you're in the courtyard or if you're in the parking lot, you can go right over here up the stairs to Pastor Dennis's team are there. They're waiting to pray for you. They're excited to pray for you. They'll keep the right distance, but they want to lift up prayers and their prayers have power in the name of Jesus. Be part of that. If you're online, all you need to do is call or text as you see on the screen there. And we have people waiting to pray with you uh, through that avenue. And if you're new at Shoreline, uh, if you're here in the courtyard or in the, in the parking lot, you can go right over to the welcome booth. Patty will be back there. You can see the big giant blue and silver balloons. Go right there. She wants to give you a gift. Thank you for coming and tell you more about the church. If you're online, uh, you can just simply send the word welcome, text it to the number you see right there, and we will follow up with you. Answer your questions, get to know you, and give you a warm welcome to Shoreline Church. And then finally, I'll say one more time, if you want to jump into the spiritual gifts class, register right after the service and jump in at one o'clock. Here's my last word before I send you out for the word of blessing. Um, it's so easy to sit in the service, whether you're, whether you're online or whether you're here on campus, and say, boy, that's, that's good, that's true. I gotta do something about that. And about five minutes later, we're on to the next thing. I wanna encourage you not to do that. But as you go from here, as we close this time, will you be reminded of who Jesus is? and what he did for you and who you are because of it. And will you then follow his leadership, walk in his footsteps and humbly serve everywhere you go all the time and especially using the gifts he's given you for his glory. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday for part three of the Humble Service series. God bless you.